The Advanced Fetal Care Center at Children's Hospital Boston serves families facing complex birth anomalies and other critical challenges to the health of their unborn and newborn infants. The Advanced Fetal Care Center at Children's Hospital Boston, the pioneer in fetal cardiac intervention, has performed more than 50 cardiac catheterization aortic stenosis procedures to date. The center is the only one of its kind in New England and is a national leader in comprehensive fetal care. Today's webcast will offer a Harvard Medical Faculty panel to discuss up-to-date information on the latest treatments and interventions for patients with complex cardiac fetal anomalies, as well as expert discussions on diagnosis and state-of-the-art technologies from some of the world's leading practitioners in fetal medicine. During the program, you may send your questions to the panel at any time. Just click the M Direct Access button on the screen. Thank you very much for uh, attending this um, first ever live webcast uh, here from uh, Harvard Medical School in association with Children's Hospital uh, Boston. Uh, I represent the Advanced Fetal Care Center as a, as a director, and I would like to introduce our, um, our topic today. It's going to be fetal surgery for uh, congenital heart disease, quite the cutting edge uh, topic. First, we'll have Dr. Wayne Turetsky, who will talk about uh, some of the techniques. We also have uh, with uh, him as one of our presenters, Dr. Louise wilkins Hogg, who's the uh, director uh, of the Center for Fetal Medicine, as well as um, uh, a skilled uh, fetal interventionist. And we have Dr. Carol Benson, who's the director of uh, uh, ultrasonography and fetal ultrasound at the Brigham Women's Hospital. This is, uh, represents a very collaborative effort between uh, both Children's Hospitals and uh, Brigham Women's Hospital uh, to push back uh, the diseases in the fetus and turn this into a, um, uh, a viable fetal surgical uh, program. So, Dr. Turetsky. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, <coughs> Rusty, uh, thanks for inviting me to talk at this conference. Um, <coughs> so I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about the background and the uh, rationale for uh, performing these procedures. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the natural history of these defects, uh, which uh, will explain why we have considered doing fetal interventions. Uh, and then. Louise and Carol are going to talk about some of the techniques we use, uh, the maternal issues, and then I'm going to come back at, at the end and talk about uh, the results and outcomes and some of the complications that we have encountered. So I'm going to take a step back 50 years uh, to start out uh, and, and tell you a little bit about the history of fetal cardiac, uh, sorry, about cardiac surgery in general. And uh, in the 1950s, Dr. Lillehei in Minnesota uh, used a technique called cross-circulation, which involved connecting the parent's circulation to the child as a technique for cardiopulmonary bypass to repair congenital heart defects, um, and at the time was described as a procedure with a potential 200% mortality. And some of the children who uh, were operated on using that technique are still alive today, uh, and so it was effective, but was, of course, replaced by um, mechanical uh, bypass machine. And in a way now we've come uh, 50 years later full circle where once again we're actually using the parent, in this case the mother, as the uh, bypass machine uh, for the fetus while we're performing uh, in utero interventions using of course the placenta for oxygenation um, and the mother's blood pressure of course to provide circulation as well and placental perfusion. <coughs> now we are really going to talk about three cardiac lesions uh, uh, that we are addressing in our program. The one is aortic valve stenosis with evolving hyperplastic left heart syndrome. Aortic valve stenosis in the fetus is one of the etiologies of hyperplastic left heart syndrome. Now, what we intend to do with our procedures is to prevent progression to hyperplastic left heart syndrome and with the hope of maintaining a biventricular circulation. The second defect we address is established hyperplastic left heart syndrome where there is an intact or very restrictive atrial septum where blood cannot escape out of the heart once the baby's born. And these babies are born very ill and have a very high surgical uh, mortality. The third lesion, uh, which we've made progress on more recently, 
uh, is pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum or hypoplastic right heart syndrome, again, hoping to prevent progression uh, to ventricular hypoplasia. So why, why is this so important uh, for, for our field, uh, to prevent aortic stenosis evolving into hypoplastic left heart syndrome? Well, uh, we have made a lot of progress in treating children with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, but they still, despite all the progress we've made, still have uh, one of the highest mortalities for uh, congenital heart surgery, still around, depending on the institution, uh, 10 to 20 percent uh, mortality, uh, at least for the first stage, compared to most regular cardiac surgeries around uh, 1 to 2 percent mortality. And there's also, because of the nature of the disease, significant morbidity. So the early outcomes certainly are improving for this disease, but the long-term outcomes are really unknown, say, beyond uh, two decades. And of course, it's quite enticing to try and create a two-ventricle circulation from something that was meant to be a one-ventricle circulation. And the techniques we develop will benefit other kids in the future. <coughs> the challenges that we face are, of course, maternal safety. Louise is going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, the fact that postnatal results are improving, uh, uh, surgery for hypoplastic left heart um, are improving, so that's another uh, uh, competitor for us uh, because the children are doing better now, but we still don't think it's good enough. Um, and there's a little bit of history in terms of radical new therapies. If you look at transposition of the great arteries where uh, the sending operation had a very high success rate uh, where there was an atrial switch performed, and then in the early 1980s that was changed to an arterial switch operation where there was initially a high mortality uh, as part of the learning curve, and people were questioning what they were doing. And in a way, we're really uh, uh, doing something like that, where we have a radical new therapy. We don't have that high mortality, but uh, we do have established reasonable results now, and so that is a challenge for us. We also don't have any animal model right now, for certainly for aortic stenosis, to test the biological hypothesis of what we're doing. <clears throat> Just to remind you what hypoplastic left heart syndrome looks like in this cartoon, basically a um, very small left ventricle where the left ventricle is unable postnatally to support the systemic circulation. These children have to undergo three complex surgeries, and I'm not going to go through these in detail, but I'm sure you've all heard of the Norwood, the Glenn, and the Fontan operations. Essentially, they end up with a single ventricle circulation. So the question we get asked most uh, is, how do you know it's going to be a hypoplast? Because when you see a picture like this, this is a, a cross-section of a fetal chest. This is a dilated left ventricle and a compressed right ventricle and dilated left atrium. It's hard to believe that when you have something that's two or three times its normal size to call that hypoplasia. But indeed, this is aortic stenosis with severe left ventricular dilation and dysfunction. And this ventricle from this point on will probably not grow much and be the same size at birth. And so it may seem paradoxical that a larger left ventricle ultimately will be hypoplastic. Um, and so we need to know something about the natural history of this disease to really know that this is going to be hypoplastic left heart. Uh, in this paper by John Simpson from Guy's Hospital in London, he looked at the natural history of aortic stenosis, and he showed that in those that with continuing pregnancies, even though they had some dilated ventricles at the time of diagnosis, they essentially had flat line growth the rest of gestation, aside from one or two patients. We then looked at the natural history in, uh, at Children's Hospital of aortic stenosis fetuses, we had 43 fetuses that we uh, <coughs> found in our database, under 30 weeks gestation. Uh, and we based this on some of the selection criteria we use for our fetal interventions. Uh, and most of them had dilated ventricles, left ventricles. Uh, not surprisingly, there was a significant proportion uh, that terminated the pregnancy. Um, and this is over the last 14 years. Um, and we had 23 live-born neonates. And what we were interested to know was which ones developed hyperplastic left heart and which ones did not. So 17 out of those 23 did develop hyperplastic left heart, and six patients did not. And we wanted to know what was different about this group at their first fetal echo way back uh, under 30 weeks. And what we found that those that went on to develop hyperplastic left heart all had retrograde flow in the aortic arch. It should be antegrade. They had left to right flow at the foramen ovale. It should be right to left in the fetus. They had monophasic or fused mitral valve inflow. It should be biphasic and they all had moderate to severe dysfunction. The patients who ultimately had a biventricular circulation where the ventricle was adequate had basically the opposite. They had anterograde flow in the arch 
and only mild or at most moderate uh, LV dysfunction. When we looked at the growth, uh, this is a pretty busy chart, but basically looks at the aortic valve, ascending aorta, mitral valve, and LV length growth. Those that ultimately developed hyperplastic left heart fell off the curve. These are the plus and minus two standard deviations. All of these measurements fell off the curve, whereas those that had a biventricular circulation stayed within the normal range. We think that the pathogenesis of this disease is essentially aortic stenosis, dysfunction, myocardial damage, elevated left-sided pressure, reversal of flow, decreased filling, and ultimately growth arrest. And so we would like to interrupt this somewhere, interrupt the process early on. So the features, again, just to summarize, we look at a dilated left ventricle, severe aortic stenosis, dysfunction, reversal of the normal fetal flow patterns, and increased echogenicity, what we think is probably scar tissue in the endocardium. And if you follow these patients serially, you find stagnant growth. This is a typical patient that you see a dilated ventricle. Mitral regurgitation is the blue jet. Here's the left ventricle, left atrium, and here's the left to right flow, and it should be right to left in utero. <clears throat> I'm briefly going to talk about the natural history or what we know about uh, the other lesion that I discussed, which is hyperplastic left heart syndrome with an intact or restrictive atrial septum. So the other patients were aortic stenosis with evolving hyperplastic left heart. These ones have established hyperplastic left heart. These are, are clearly going to be hyperplastic left heart uh, at birth. The problem in these patients is that once they're born, blood cannot escape out of their lungs or out of the left atrium, uh, and they, um, they will die without therapy. They also have a much higher... Uh, surgical mortality because of the pulmonary hypertension and lung damage. So we devised a procedure which basically involved making a hole in the atrial septum in utero. There is some natural history data. Uh, there's a paper by Reichick which basically showed at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which does good work with hyperplastic left heart, uh, that their overall survival was only about 33% and they had no survivors uh, in patients with no decompressing vein. Um, and we found similar data uh, <coughs> in a paper done uh, by uh, Mary Vandervelde uh, and Antonio Flahos, who basically showed our patients that required immersion therapy after birth um, had only a 48% survival at 30 days. And uh, overall, our survival for hyperplastic left heart these days is somewhere around 90%. So these patients um, in the survival curve basically show that these patients have twice the mortality at a minimum of our regular hyperplastic left heart syndrome babies. Um, so I think uh, Louise and Carol are going to talk now a little bit about the techniques and the maternal issues, and then I'm going to come back and talk about results. Great, thank you. I wanted to pick up where Wayne left off and speak a little bit about our first approach to the, the mothers then that come in when they've been considered to be candidates for this intervention. Okay, so there we are. I'm on. So I think when um, the, the fetus is evaluated, there are certain criteria that we look for in the fetus to include or exclude them from possibility of benefit from this procedure. But I think certainly overall, um, there's also a large component that's focused on looking at the maternal complications and then on what are the fetal limitations and risks that are going to be undertaken by doing this procedure. Um, as, as you've heard, there's some natural history data that can be looked at to identify what is going to be the outcome if no intervention is performed. Um, there is also some limited series done of aortic valve dilation, and we had those for some comparison as to what were the potential fetal limitations and risk that were going to be undertaken. Certainly, the maternal risk then fall into two, two categories. Um, one, those risks which can be anticipated at the time of the operative procedure, and then as importantly, what are the post-operative complications going to be, post-operative being not only in the immediate um, period following the surgery, but also for further reproduction. So I think from the worldwide experience, we did have some information as to what 
the fetus was going to be able to tolerate when there were attempts made to dilate the fetal aortic valve. And this was from a series that was published in 2000, but really included cases that had been done through the late 1980s and 1990s. And as you can see, there was a fairly high rate of fetal complications, mostly with bradycardia being seen in three-fourths of the cases, as well as a fairly high post-procedural loss rate of almost 60%. I think we looked at this and decided to see what other information we could come up with to try to assess where we thought our risk stood then in the year 2000 with markedly improved resolution by ultrasound as well as improvements in technology and whether we could really alter what were the risk and the limitations that were faced by the initial um, investigators who were trying to look at in utero aortic valve dilation. What we know from doing other needle procedures in maternal fetal medicine is that we have about a 1 to 2 percent risk um, as you go from more invasive studies from amniocentesis up through trying to get a sample from the umbilical cord through a per percutaneous umbilical blood sampling. What we wanted a little bit more information on was what were the risks that were known if you're trying to get a sample of blood from the fetal heart or if you're trying to transfuse into the fetal heart both of those situations being analogous somewhat to the risk that we thought we could anticipate then with trying to place a styletted needle into the fetal heart in order to allow access for a catheter to be placed to use for dilation across the valve. And there was some data out in the literature for patients who had undergone direct fetal cardiac punctures when there were not other sites attainable for prenatal diagnostic testing. And those results and risk looked a little bit better than what had been uh, reported in the initial series of cardiac interventions in that they did still see bradycardia about 10 percent of the time. Um, their rate of rupture of membranes was only 2 percent, not that markedly different from other needle procedures that we do, and a very low rate of blood around the pericardial sac. They also, in that um, series though, did find <coughs> excuse me, that there was a rate of, of fetal loss, not nearly as high as in the initial cardiac series which had been published, but if you took all loss up until four weeks, it was probably in the order of about 6%. So certainly greater than we expect from an umbilical blood sample or an amniocentesis, but not as markedly high as the 60% that was originally reported. And certainly they showed that on fetuses that had to have multiple attempts at an intracardiac puncture, the loss and the complication rate increased. I think the other information that we had was um, some baseline for what would be the risk for not only trying to get a sample from the fetal heart, but also trying to stay in place and transfuse. And this was really based on some um, older data that had been gathered looking at patients that needed um, in utero blood transfusion when there was no other site except within the fetal heart to place the blood. So certainly um, they were able to give us some information as to how often we thought we could get in and stay in place, about 60% of the time. And again, the complications that they encountered were, were slightly greater than if just going in to sample blood from the fetal heart, but still lower than what we had anticipated earlier in that there was about a 16% rate of fetal bradycardia, and the demise rate within 24 hours was really not significantly different, was about 8%. So we felt that at this point we had some realistic numbers that we could share with the parents as to what our complications from an actual attempt would be at trying to get into the fetal heart uh, with a 19-18 gauge needle staying in place in time to allow a wire to be guided across the valve and a catheter to be um, inflated. The other area though of risk and limitations to the procedure are really what are faced by the woman herself. Um, certainly to remember that, that she's a co-passenger here in this whole procedure and there are intraoperative and postoperative risk. The intraoperative risk we really assessed from the information that we had from other fetal surgeries that had been done, but also uniquely to our procedure is the amount of fetal manipulation which is done um, through the mother's um, abdomen and through the uterine wall, very similar to the external versions that are done in term fetuses when they're trying to convert a breech presentation to a, a vertex presentation. So we had some numbers that we could work with from there as far as the risk of abruption. Um, certainly reported with other fetal surgeries are the risk of fluid overload and pulmonary edema and then cardiovascular compromise primarily related to um, a blood loss if it occurs. Postoperatively, the risks that occur are related to complications that ensue from preterm labor. And certainly in other arenas of fetal surgery, this has been one of the largest obstacles that 
as yet has not been overcome, certainly for the open uterine incisions and also for the, the laparoscopic or fetoscopic procedures, there's still a markedly high rate of premature rupture of the membranes and premature labor. And then associated with that, the maternal complications that go with the efforts to try to stop the labor and the use of the tocolytics. Certainly when the women come through um, for evaluation, they meet a large host of people and some of the evaluation is directed specifically at assessing their risk. Um, we do an initial ultrasound evaluation, not necessarily even looking at the fetus, but trying to gather other information that's going to be helpful for us to try to provide the mother some realistic information. We look at where the placenta is located. Um, we measure the cervical length and try to assess any other risk factors from the ultrasound that is going to place the mother at increased risk for complication. The, um, early on in our series, the ability to open the maternal abdomen through a laparotomy but not a hysterotomy markedly changed our technical success rate and we went from a 20% technical success rate up to an 83% technical success rate by having the ability, though it's not always used, to move from a percutaneous technique to a laparotomy technique. And since that time when we've been um, utilizing the option of a laparotomy, about two-thirds of the time we do end up going to a laparotomy. And to give you just a little bit of an idea of what, what that looks like, um, it's a standard laparotomy, usually um, in a fan steel location. We do use a malleable retractor so that we do not get reflection from the metal retractors with the ultrasound, um, and then open the, the skin and the subcutaneous tissue and fascia down to the level of the, of the uterus, but do not make a hysterotomy. The reasons for doing this, we have found, are, are varied. Um, often it can be due to a larger um, BMI in the mother that we're not getting good um, ability to manipulate the fetus or to image. Um, other times if she's had prior incisions with cesarean sections, she can have scars that we can't image through well. And certainly direct manipulation then on the uterus only um, also allows us to um, do further manipulation for positioning as well as improve some of the ultrasound resolution um, if there are obstacles in the way. And then certainly it's, it's not done as a hysterotomy but then as a technique directly through the uterine wall. One thing that we've looked at is to be able to give the patients information about who do we think we are going to be technically successful in. And I think um, Dr. Benson will get to this in a minute as to what we define as a technical success. Um, we looked at various parameters that we would have information on before she even went to the operating room and we're not able to find any that really um, were a key to how likely it was that the case was going to be technically successful. No difference in gestational age, they've all been around 23 weeks. Maternal BMI really didn't impact it once we had the ability to utilize a laparotomy and really the location of the placenta did not impact whether or not we were going to be technically su successful. We also looked at if we could predict whether or not she was going to fall into that two-thirds group that do need a laparotomy and again did not find any clear predictors, not really driven by gestational age. Um, you know, there's some indication that for the higher maternal BMIs we're more likely to utilize laparotomy but it's not significant with these low numbers and no influence of to where the placenta was located. The post-operative complications that we've encountered in the mothers have been, we've had uh, one case of maternal respiratory compromise in a woman who had uh, a procedure done in the setting of uh, fetal hydrops and probably evolved into some uh, respiratory compromise due to not only the fetal hydrops but also fluid overload. Um, that cleared quickly at, at two days post-operative. We've had one isolated case of an incision inf infection which cleared with IV antibiotics. Um, we've had no, no cases of um, maternal bleeding that required um, any blood transfusion and really no maternal bleedings at all. And the average hospital stay for the women is about two and a half days. Um, typically if it's a percutaneous procedure they go home the next day. If it's a laparotomy then they go home um, on average then at two and a half days. We have had two women out of the group, that, the series that we've done, who did deliver spontaneously um, following the procedure. 
Um, one delivered approximately two weeks after the procedure with cervical incompetence, had had ultrasounds at the time of the procedure and following the procedure with no change in her cervix and then came in with, with true cervical incompetence and painless dilatation about two and a half weeks after the procedure and delivered and another instance then of rupture of membranes and, and preterm delivery uh, within four weeks after the procedure. The remaining women generally have delivered at term. Their route of delivery has not been altered by the fact that they've had a laparotomy, meaning that those who were planning to have a vaginal delivery have gone on to have a vaginal delivery and have only had C-sections done for routine obstetric indications such as elective repeat breach presentation. And I'd like to pass it over now to Dr. Benson to talk a little bit about the, the procedure itself. Thank you. I'm going to be showing the uh, imaging that's done during the procedure so that you can get an idea of how the procedure is performed. I'll start with the uh, fetuses with aortic stenosis who are developing hypoplastic left heart. As was mentioned, the goal of our intervention is to try to prevent progression to hypoplastic left heart or to minimize the degree of hypoplastic left heart or even to try to reverse progression to hypoplastic left heart. <clears throat> this is a fetus who did not have inter successful intervention. This is a fetus at 20 weeks who had aortic stenosis. And you can see that at the time of the 20 week scan that the left ventricle, oh, my pointer's not working. Oh, sorry, one second, just want to turn my pointer on. That the left ventricle is dilated, bigger than the right ventricle, and bulging towards the right ventricle at 20 weeks gestation due to a very narrow aorta here, you can see that already one week later, the left ventricle has now shrunk. It's much smaller than the right ventricle. The apex of the right ventricle now wraps around the apex of the left ventricle. So the progression to hypoplastic left heart can, in some cases, occur very quickly, and this is why we want to catch these fetuses when the left ventricle is bigger than the right ventricle, because it does progress very fast in some cases. <coughs> So the steps of our procedure, we start by evaluating the fetus to make sure that the fetus appears normal, to look at the structures in the fetus, see how big the left ventricle is, assess the left ventricular contractility, assess flow across the aortic valve, and measure the width of the aortic valve. And then we do our procedures by passing a needle through the uterine wall into the heart of the fetus by monitoring with ultrasound either on the surface of the uterus if we've done a laparotomy or on the surface of the mom if we haven't. And the goal of our procedure is to slide a needle into the left ventricle and here you can see a, a left ventricle, here's the aortic outflow tract. This left ventricle is actually already a little bit smaller than the right, but this is just a diagram. So we pass a needle into the heart and then the needle has a cannula in it that we take out the center of the needle and then we advance a wire across the valve and then over that wire we pass a balloon and then once that balloon straddles the valve we can blow that balloon up a couple times, we can reposition it with the goal of expanding the valve so that we can then open it up. In order to accomplish this, we need to make sure that the fetal position is absolutely ideal so that we can get the needle along the track and into position. So here are a couple fetuses where we've lined the fetus up to do the procedure. Here in this case, you can see it's an oblique view of the heart because we have a long axis of the left ventricle with a straight up and down into the aortic valve. And here's another one where you can see the the left ventricle with the aortic valve sitting straight. It's a straight shot. <clears throat> so before we can start the procedure, we've got to make sure that the baby's not going to move. And so what we do here is we use a paralytic agent that we inject intramuscularly into the fetus, typically into the buttocks or the thigh. And here's an example of when we're injecting a baby into the buttocks. You can see the needle crossing through the maternal abdomen, through the uterine wall, and then into the buttocks of the fetus, and then once it's in position, you can see with the little micro bubbles, that's the injection into the, into the baby's buttocks, and that assures that the baby won't move. And then using continuous ultrasound guidance, we pass the needle through the maternal abdomen and the uterus into the left ventricle of the fetus. 
By using continuous ultrasound guidance, we can modify our route. You can see as this needle is advancing through the fetal chest wall into the fetal left, into the left ventricle, that the fetus does move as you push against it. So even as you think you've got a straight shot, you need to modify the direction of the needle even during the course of the pressure of the needle to make sure that it continues along the course of the fetal heart. And so it's not quite a straight shot. You can see that we're, re we're just as we're about to go through, that Louise is tipping the needle down a little bit to make sure that we end up inside the left ventricle. And then our goal is to have the needle inside the left ventricle pointing right at the aortic valve so when the, the, needle, when the wire will come out, it will cross the valve. So we remove the trocar from the cannula and insert the wire and direct the wire across the aortic valve. So here you can see we have the cannula in the left ventricle. You can see the wire snaking out of the cannula, and in this case, it popped right across the aortic valve up into the aortic arch. And so now it's in good position, sitting inside the aorta, perfect position to now slide the balloon catheter out over so that it will, it will straddle the aortic valve. So our next, uh, next step then is to pass that catheter over the wire and inflate the balloon. So here you can see we've passed the, the catheter out of the cannula and it's traveling along the wire so that it straddles the aortic valve. And you can see with the bubbles what we see when we blow up the balloon that confirms the location of the balloon and that balloon is measured so that it will dilate the valve to a size that would be appropriate or even slightly larger than you'd want the opening to be for gestational age. Here's another case, this is a magnified view of the heart, but you can see that the wire is across the aortic valve and up into the ascending aorta, and that the catheter is being advanced to straddle the valve. Now here the catheter is in place, and you can see as the catheter expands, you can see the width of the, of the balloon as it is wrapped around the wire and travels right across the aortic valve. Here just a couple more. Here you can see the catheter straddling the valve, and then you can see the extent of the balloon. The bubbles are micro bubbles that are inside what's injected into the balloon. And here's the same baby with just another injection and deflation, because we do dilate the valve a couple times. Here's another one. You can see the micro bubbles, and that confirms that the balloon is filled. And here you can see the balloon begins filled as a filled location, and then as you deflate, you can prove that the balloon was truly across the valve. It's very important to know that you've that you're been in proper position and that the balloon is truly across the valve. And then when we're all done, we pull everything out. And even watching pulling out it helps confirm that we were in the right location. You can see when we pull this out that, in fact, the wire was way up in the aortic arch. And as we pull it out, you can see the wire passing down and being pulled out with the cannula. Immediately following the removal of the needle, we do want to make sure that we've had technical su success, that is, that we've increased the flow across the aortic valve. And here's a case immediately after the procedure. This is a view of the left ventricle, and this is the ascending aorta up to the arch. You can see on this clip that there's a large jet of blood flowing up out through the aorta into the ascending aorta, and then the, the jet turns blue because the arch curves away from the transducer. And so this confirms that we now have anti-grade flow in the arch, and that was our goal. These patients all start with retrograde flow in the arch. So this is a technical success with an immediate improvement in the hemodynamics. <coughs> now the other procedure I'm going to show you are those fetuses with a hypoplastic left heart who have restricted atrial septums. These fetuses have a fairly, very high mortality, in some studies as high as 50%. So the goal in these cases is to open up some channels in the atrial septum so that the, the fetus can improve its pulmonary blood flow in utero, and then as soon as the baby's born, allow the pulmonary venous return to get into the right side of the heart so it can get to the rest of the baby after birth. So as with the aortic valves, we need to position the fetus very carefully. We paralyze the fetus in the same way we do with the aortic valve dilations. And then in this case, we pass the needle in in through the, into the right side of the heart by going into the right atrium. And then we pass the needle directly across the septum and advance a wire and then pull the needle back 
so that we then have a wire through the septum that will allow us to advance the balloon and make holes in the septum. So here's a fetus who has a hypoplastic left heart. This is, would be a four-chamber view of the heart, but almost all of this is the right ventricle. This is the right atrium, and this is the left atrium. And you can see that the atrial septum is bulging up into the right atrium. And it's bulging up because the septum is closed. In order for this baby, for a hypoplastic left heart, to have, to have reasonable function, you need to have left to right flow from the left atrium to the right atrium. But in this case, the septum is closed off. So we want to make a channel in that septum. So as with the aortic valves, we use continuous ultrasound guidance to place us into the proper position, and we modify our approach as we go. Now, this is a different fetus with a restricted septum. In this case, you can see that the left atrium is dilated, but the septum is quite thick and fibrous, and we're passing our needle now through the mom's abdominal wall, through the uterus and the placenta to try to enter the right atrium in this case. And then once we're in the right atrium, we're going to advance across that thick septum, and we're going to pass the needle all the way through that septum so that we're past the septum, so that when we advance the wire, it'll be in the left atrium or even into the pulmonary veins. Once into the left atrium, having crossed the septum, we'll remove the trocar and insert a wire. So here you can see now we're inserting the wire out into the left side of the heart, and it's actually tracking into a pulmonary vein. And so the next step then is to pull the trocar back and advance a balloon so that the balloon then straddles the septum. And then here you can see with the echoes that we've blown up a balloon, that the balloon straddles the septum, showing us that we've made a hole in this septum. We do it a couple times, and then we pull everything out. We might, in this case, we pulled back a little bit to, to reposition, um, and then we might blow up the balloon again. We might even sometimes, in a couple cases, we've gone across the septum in more than one location to try to make more than one hole. And then when we're all done, we pull everything out, as you can see here, coming out from the pulmonary vein across the septum and all the way out of the mom's body. And then we look to see how we did. And here, as you can see, a case of a hypoplastic left heart with, that used to have a restricted atrial septum. But now we've made a nice hole in that septum. And you can see a huge jet of flow that's continuous, allowing for flow from the left, side of the, from the left atrium into the right atrium to decompress the pulmonary venous return. I'm just going to uh, spend the last few minutes, minutes talking about pulmonic stenosis. I actually wasn't going to talk about this when I put my talk together, so you won't find any of this in your syllabus. But on Wednesday, we had our first successful pulmonic atresia valve dilatation. And so I have pictures to show you. I put them in my talk just this morning. This is a fetus, or the, the, these cases are fetuses who have pulmonic stenosis developing hypoplastic right heart. And as with the, atrial, the aortic stenoses, in this case, we're hoping by dilating the pulmonic valve that we will be able to prevent or reverse or at least minimize the degree of hypoplastic right heart in these fetuses. So here is the preoperative pre evaluation of the fetus. You can see on the four-chamber view of the heart that the right ventricle is significantly smaller than the left ventricle, and also that the right ventricle isn't moving very well. Up here is a view of the, the pulmonary outflow tract. You can see marked narrowing at the site of the pulmonary valve and then a little bit of post stenotic dilatation in the main pulmonary artery. This is the Doppler of the ductus arteriosus next to the aorta, and you can see that flow in the ductus arteriosus is in the direction towards the pulmonary valve, so it's in the reverse direction because normally blood flow from the pulmonary artery carries blood posteriorly into the aorta, so this reverse direction of flow in the ductus arteriosus. So here you can see we've lined it up in a similar fashion to the way we line up the aortic valves. Here's the right ventricle, here's that pulmonic valve with a little bit of the pulmonary artery. So we've got the needle coming in towards the right ventricle. You can see it's not perfectly lined up, so before we're going to go any further, we're going to adjust just a little bit to make sure that we head into the right ventricle. And here we are now, we've crossed into the apex of the right ventricle, and the tip of the needle is pointing right at that stenotic valve. We then pass the wire out, and in this case, it was able to get through that stenotic valve um, and pass up into the pulmonary artery. And so the next step is to have the 
position the balloon so that it straddles the valve. And indeed, we were sure we were straddling the valve at this point, so we blew up the balloon, and we did this a couple times. And then immediately after the procedure, you can see this is the four-chamber view of the heart with the left ventricle here and the right ventricle here. And you can see only a tiny bit of tricuspid regurgitation, which was markedly different than on the preoperative views where all of the blood that was going into the right ventricle was forced back through the tricuspid valve. Now that we'd opened up the pulmonary valve, the amount of tricuspid regurgitation was this, just this little blue flash. And we had good flow in the pulmonary artery in the normal direction of flow, you can see it extended up here with a little bit of pulmonic regurgitation. Now, I didn't have time to show you, I didn't have time to get the pictures from the post-operative exam, which was just yesterday. But yesterday, when I looked at the baby again, I saw that the flow in the ductus arteriosus is now there's lots of flow, and it's in the normal direction from the pulmonary artery to the aorta. So we've got three types of procedures now where we can successfully intervene and show immediate changes in the blood flow in the vessels that we've treated. I'll now introduce uh, Wayne again. He's going to be talking about the outcome of the fetuses that we've treated. Thanks, Carol and Louise. Um, I'm going to just, uh, after you've seen uh, how we select our patients and how we perform these procedures, uh, what has happened to these patients. Um, so, um, as far as aortic stenosis is concerned, uh, we've performed 34 attempted procedures. Um, the uh, median gestational age at the diagnosis is about 22 weeks and at procedure 23 weeks um, and uh, the expected range where one would diagnose uh, uh, prenatal heart disease. Um, for this particular lesion we have performed uh, over half of them now um, percutaneous. Louise's uh, data included the, some of the pulmonary treasure ones and all the other patients but for this particular lesion we're now just over half uh, percutaneous. Um, in terms of technical success, and by technical success we mean a balloon clearly inflated, straddling across the valve with a demonstrable increase in color flow uh, by color Doppler. That's how we define technical success. Uh, there's certainly been a learning curve overall, about 80% for this lesion. Um, in our first 14 procedures until September 2003, we had about a 50% success rate, but since then, it's been, uh, we've only had one unsuccessful one, so it's been 95% technical success since September 2003. Not surprisingly, uh, and similar to what they showed in the original uh, uh, summary of the uh, worldwide experience, uh, there have been complications. Um, this includes uh, the first 29 patients. It's not updated for the last five, but the data is about the same in terms of the percentages. Uh, not surprisingly, we've seen bradycardia, as other people have seen, uh, including in Louisa's data on obstetric procedures, in about uh, just over a third of patients. Uh, surprising to us, we've seen very few pericardial effusions, and they're all easily treated with uh, a pericardial tap. Um, we have had about a 10% uh, rate of fetal demise, um, uh, but half of the patients who had a fetal demise or premature death and demise had high drops. So these were already very sick babies. Um, and we've also seen uh, what we think is early intracardiac thrombus formation, and I'll show you an example of that. Uh, we're still puzzled by what this appearance is. And uh, as far as sort of cath complications, we have seen several instances of balloon rapture, but we are, uh, our cath team are uh, inflating these balloons up to their maximal inflation pressure. So the overall outcomes of these patients, and I'll go through this uh, slowly, we've evaluated 40 patients for aortic valvuloplasties. Uh, some patients have, of course, declined uh, the procedure and have had the typical outcome for hypoplastic left heart. Of the unsuccessful procedures, uh, there's still one in utero, uh, some have been live-born, uh, have had surgery for hypoplastic left heart, and uh, some have uh, either died or terminated the pregnancy. This is the very interesting group to us, is the ones that have had a successful procedure, and that'll be shown on the next slide. We still have two patients in utero after a successful procedure. 
We've had one late fetal demise in a patient that had uh, intrauterine growth retardation. It was several weeks later. We're not sure what that was due to. Uh, we've had uh, a premature birth in a baby with severe high drops uh, that was born prematurely and died. We've had one that had rupture of membranes uh, several days after the procedure, uh, after successful procedure and delivered. And then we've had uh, uh, two others that have died uh, in utero several days after the procedure, one with severe high drops. The two interesting groups are the live-born babies after successful procedure. We now have seven babies uh, that do not have hyperplastic left heart syndrome or out there with a biventricular circulation. Uh, some of them have required uh, coarctation repair, uh, balloon dilation postnatally, but they do not have hyperplastic left heart syndrome. And there's one particularly interesting patient in there that I'm sure Dr. Del Nido will talk about uh, tomorrow um, in his talk. Um, this group of 13 patients who are live born with hyperplastic left heart who, who sort of have a version of hyperplastic left heart, these patients still have a flow through the left ventricle, flow across the aortic valve uh, that is contributing to the circulation. So these are not what we would call full-blown hyperplastic left heart syndrome. And those babies have done very well. Only one of them has actually died after surgery. So that's a very interesting group to us. And that is a group that Dr. Del Nido is going to talk about tomorrow and how we now plan to modify the postnatal surgery to promote ongoing left ventricular growth after birth. I'll just show you an example of some of the complications we've encountered. Fetal resuscitation, we encountered bradycardia, not surprisingly, that's what it looks like. You can see Louise performing CPR on the fetus externally through the mother's abdomen. Uh, several seconds later, we stick a 22 gauge needle back into the heart and inject epinephrine directly into the heart. You can see the little micro cavitations as the epinephrine is injected. And literally seconds later, the fetal heart rate has recovered. We've encountered this, uh, as I say, in about uh, over a third of patients. And in every case, the bradycardia has responded to uh, stimulation and intracardiac epinephrine. We've not had a baby not recover from that. Um, we think that, obviously, cardiac puncture, as you've seen before, leads to these complications, such as effusions and uh, a bradycardia. This is an example of a balloon rupture. As the balloon is inflated, you can see the saline, the saline from the balloon filling the heart, and that clears again within seconds and does not appear to be a problem. This is that early thrombus formation, or at least we think that's what it is. We see this echogenic appearance. This was a patient that had very little flow through the left ventricle, and the wire uh, curled up in the ventricle, so you're introducing a foreign body uh, into stagnant blood, and that is probably a setup for early thrombus formation. In this case, we opened up the valve, and this thrombus cleared within uh, several hours, and we have not seen any neurological sequelae. We think this is just early stagnant blood, and that it's not organized thrombus yet, but we don't quite understand it. This is an example of an effusion here. You can see the catheter actually being removed after a successful procedure. There are no problems, good heart rate, and seconds later, there is severe bradycardia and an effusion, and so the needle is stuck back again to drain the effusion, and this baby did fine uh, after the drainage of the effusion. I'm going to show you what some of these hearts look like, of course, the, uh, of that group of seven patients who we think that we have prevented progression to hyperplastic left heart. This was our first ever success. You can see the tiny, uh, you can see the severe LV dysfunction, the tiny jet of flow across the valve, and in the short axis, severe left ventricular dysfunction with echogenic myocardium. This baby underwent a successful percutaneous procedure, and uh, you can see the broad jet of flow across the valve after the valve was opened, and that's what it looked like before. So this is the kind of difference that we like to see. And this is at 18 months of age. This baby has a four-chambered heart, has mild left ventricular hypertrophy, but does not have hyperplastic left heart syndrome. And this is what we're trying to create. And you can see, compared to that 20-week echo, normal left ventricular systolic function. This is a picture uh, that I showed you early on, and, and Carol did show the balloon dilation, a 20-week fetus with a dilated ventricle, um, who was uh, born at about 36 weeks after successful procedure, 3D, four-chamber view. You can see still echogenic endocardium, right ventricle slightly longer than the left ventricle, but improving function. And this baby went home after about three weeks uh, in the ICU, progressively got better, and did not require anything done after birth. We're trying to learn about this disease. We've, we've started to perform MRIs on these patients, and we're learning a little bit about their appearance. You can still see that this left ventricle is shorter than the right ventricle. This is the left atrium, right atrium. You can see a dilated left atrium. Here's the spine. Good left ventricular function. And MRI is going to be helping us look at the myocardial properties in these patients. Um, 
As far as the hyperplastic left heart with the intact septum, uh, we're starting to make more progress with this lesion. Uh, it, uh, I think we've got a way to go, but we certainly are encouraged by results. We've now performed 11 of these procedures. Um, we've had uh, one field demise related to this procedure. We've had three neonatal deaths, uh, but we're now at over 50% survival, uh, and we spoke about the natural history. We still have one in utero. Um, uh, should be delivered in the next few weeks. So um, we are, we're continuing to develop new techniques and equipment to assist with this procedure. We certainly have limitations. Uh, um, we, we're learning as we go along, and I think we're improving our techniques. Fetal positioning, uh, we've made progress, but that still seems to be the most important thing with this procedure. Fetal stabilization. Imaging uh, uh, seems to be better on the uterus, although we prefer not to perform a laparotomy. And of course, we're using equipment that is not designed for fetal procedures. We're using adult coronary artery and radiology equipment. There's certain biological limitations in us still understanding these diseases. We don't have an animal model for this, and it would be very difficult to create precise animal models that mimic this. Some of the patients do come to us late. They come from 90% of our patients come from outside of Massachusetts, and they often get to us late. We need to improve patient selection. And uh, we're beginning to realize now that a more uniform postnatal approach uh, in treating these patients, uh, which Dr. Del Nido will talk about, is becoming more and more important because we think that the fetal procedure is uh, going to be part of our success, but postnatal tailored management in a uniform manner is going to contribute to increasing success uh, in these lesions. We're continuing to try and improve the rates of prenatal diagnosis. We need early diagnosis and referral. We certainly are improving our techniques and learning a lot. Uh, we're working on developing some new equipment and potential for the use of 3D and maybe even MRI to help us. Uh, this week, as Carol said, we performed our 50th procedure. Uh, it's been increasing uh, by about 20% uh, every year for the last few years. We've already performed the year's a third gone, and we performed seven procedures. Um, and uh, we hope that will continue. I'd like to thank all the people involved. Many of them are in this room. Many are still working at the hospital. They can't get away. Uh, and uh, if I've left anyone out, I apologize. But this is most of the people involved in the procedure. Um, I'm going to end off now just showing a little movie, just to summarize everything, just to show you what it looks like. You've seen a lot of ultrasound. You've seen some pictures. And uh, it's about a three-minute movie. It seems like it goes on forever. But I'm going to, I'm going to just uh, show this movie. Hopefully, this will work. And we'll sort of, uh, I don't know if, uh, Louise, is your mic working there just to show? Is, it, is that working? You can show what we're doing. I don't know if you can I see that. Which, but yeah, I can. What do you want me to? I can, yeah, uh, you, why do you do it from there? Okay, the so this is uh, our CAF team preparing all their equipment uh, on the back table. Uh, that's Lisa Bergeson, one of uh, our CAF attendings, making sure that all the needles are flushed uh, and that all the wires fit through the balloons, uh, even though they're supposed to uh, fit according to the package. You have to make absolutely sure in the procedure that all the wires fit through the balloons, that the balloon and the wire fits through the needle before you put it inside the fetus, because you have to be able to get it out again. So uh, each piece of equipment uh, is, is prepared in duplicate or triplicate, uh, and we have had to sometimes uh, change equipment in the middle of the procedure. You can see here uh, where Louise and Carol are looking at the, uh, at the heart and getting uh, the optimum position of the fetus. In this patient, we performed a laparotomy. You can see the little abdominal well here. And this is our cath colleague, Audrey Marshall, getting ready with her wire. Uh, Louise and Carol here are guiding the needle uh, into the fetal heart. You'll see how uh, in a second, uh, there's Louise with the, the needle in her hand. Uh, the patient's going to receive anesthesia into a thigh uh, at the beginning of the procedure. And then after that, uh, the needle is guided into the heart, just like you've seen in the previous images. And then once the needle is in the perfect position in the left ventricular outflow tract, this is a 19-gauge needle with a stylet. You'll see as uh, uh, when Louise uh, and us feel that the needle is in the perfect position, you'll see how, if you watch over here, she removes the stylet. Uh, and uh, Audrey's getting ready with her wire. Uh, as soon as the... Needles in the outflow tract, as you see over here. The wire gets inserted, all under ultrasound guidance. You can see how the tip of the wire is, pro is probing the aortic valve. And uh, once we think that the wire is perfectly across the aortic valve, as you can see uh, into the ascending aorta, the balloon is then advanced over the wire, uh, straddling the valve. 
and uh, then inflated several times um, across the valve. And we have to make absolutely sure we do usually three to four inflations up to the maximum pressure of each balloon. Uh, and uh, you can see again here as the balloon is inflated. So there's someone on the back table here using the insufflator. And then once everything's done, you can see them pulling the equipment out of the heart. Uh, and here it comes. You can see the ultrasound picture as the equipment then is retracted out of the heart. And that's basically what it looks like, ultrasound from the inside and from the outside in the room. That's, that's it. Thank you very much. I would like to open up the, um, the floor to, uh, to questions. Uh, again, this is Dr. Carol Benson, Louise Wilkins Hogg, Wayne Tereski, and myself, Rusty Jennings. Uh, we're also, to remind you, it's a live webcast uh, around the world. Do you have any questions from our local audience? We do have some questions that come in from afar. Um, one of the questions, I guess, I would direct this to Dr. Twetsky. Um, is there special balloons and wires that you use for the, the fetus, or is there uh, equipment that you modify? The uh, equipment that um, our cath colleagues are using are actually adult coronary artery um, balloons and wires. Uh, actually, the wires are used also in pediatrics, but the balloons are coronary artery balloon dilation catheters, not made specially for uh, fetal procedures. Um, there are no, I don't think there are any special pieces of equipment, particularly right now, made for fetal cardiac intervention. These are all modified uh, adult or radiology uh, equipment. And can you see any future modifications that would help make the procedure easier or any well, development? Yeah, we have, uh, uh, Dr. Locke has uh, actually developed uh, uh, some pieces of equipment uh, which may help us in the future in terms of positioning the needle. Um, uh, and uh, if it's, certainly if we don't have optimal fetal positioning or position inside the heart, that these needles may help uh, position the wire and the balloon inside the heart. Uh, so we're working on some things like that, but the, uh, uh, right now we're stuck with uh, existing approved equipment. And uh, Dr. Benson, where else is this procedure done? Is it uh, being done other institutions, other, other places in the world? So as far as I know, it's been tried at a couple other institutions, um, I think in California one or two times. Florida a couple times, and that they haven't had too much success. Um, prior, there have been a, a, at least one center in Europe has done um, just over a dozen patients, but they have done it at an older gestational age. Those were all early third trimester, and we try to get ours um, before 26 weeks if possible. I think there, that there's more chance that the left ventricle can recover. And, um for Louise, it looks like you run a large team. Uh, you have cardiologists, sonologists, anesthesiologists for both the fetus and for the mom. Um, just uh, how do you keep this whole team together? Are there challenges you face by having such a large complex team? Well, I think that's been one of the, the real successes of the program has been getting different institutions as well as many different programs to work together. And I think that at all different levels, um, you know, from the physicians down to the operating room staff to the nurses to the coordinators. You know, everyone has gone through what the rationale is for the procedures, what the complications are, what the risks are, and really have bought on to understanding what's going on and what, what their role is in helping to really make all the pieces of this come together and that without all of the varied pieces, it really wouldn't come together. So I think with that investment in it, people um, really are at their, at their best trying to get the whole team to move forward. And the, the well, uh, one of the things that we do prior to every procedure, even though we've done this now 50 times, we still meet and talk about each case with all of the sub specialists. So everybody's in the room before we start the case and knows exactly the, you know, the, these patients, a lot of them now are quite similar, but we still talk about each case individually before we start the procedure that day. And uh, the final question I'll um, direct to Dr. Turetsky. Um, are there inclusion or exclusion criteria that you use, such as fetal age or size, for consideration of a prenatal cardiac intervention? 
So obviously each cardiac lesion has specific inclusion or exclusion criteria. So the most, the most uh, commonly performed procedure is the aortic valve dilation in utero. Um, our specific inclusion criteria, we have a formal hospital protocol now for these patients, um, are that if we believe that the patient is developing hypoplastic left heart syndrome with all those features that I uh, explained in my talk, now, of course, if the patient has established severe hypoplastic left heart syndrome, they would not be included in the aortic valve dilation group. So they have to have at least a normal size left ventricle at the time uh, of the procedure uh, with all those physiologic features such as flow reversal uh, to be included in the procedure. For the um, intact septum, uh, hypoplastic intact septum, if we believe the patient is going to need an emergent uh, atrial septostomy after birth, so these patients are born, um, they go straight from the obstetric operating room to the cath lab. Uh, so if, if that's the type of patient that we believe uh, needs an emergent procedure postnatally, we will choose to do it prenatally. If they have bidirectional flow in their pulmonary veins and if they have very little or no flow across the atrial septum. Uh, as far as the uh, pulmonary atresia with intact septum patients are concerned, we're still learning about the criteria for selecting those patients, but clearly if we believe the patient is going to have a single left ventricle, in this case a hypoplastic right ventricle, those are patients we would select for now. Uh, exclusion criteria, uh, obviously if they don't meet all those uh, inclusion criteria I mentioned, mainly are going to be um, uh, maternal exclusion criteria. So if the mother has health concerns, twins, we don't do tw twin pregnancies, uh, and uh, uh, but largely I think it would be based on maternal health concerns and Louise could potentially address, but she'd address that in her talk. Okay. Well, thank you very much. This concludes our panel discussion of fetal cardiac intervention, and it concludes our uh, webcast. So thank you very much to our panel. Thank you for watching the webcast on the latest treatments and interventions for patients with complex fetal heart anomalies from Children's Hospital Boston Advances in Fetal Care 2005 conference. To obtain more information, to make an appointment, or to receive a physician referral, please click the buttons on the screen.